If anyone can hear us, <laughs> comment. We're experimenting here. It's not appearing on my phone. There we go. There's something happening. Yeah, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Bit of a delay. Okay. So we have Robert King with us. Okay. I might yeah. as well do the intro. Okay. Never mind. I'm not going to do the intro. We have Robert King here with us at Worldview. Robert King, you are a member of the Cape Independence Advocacy Group. What, what precisely is your title again? Uh, executive committee member at the CIAG. Thanks for thanks very much for having me on the show. So, Robert, what uh, what was your trip to Iranio like? What, what what made this all happen? Why did you go to Iranio? Well, look, I'm uh, in in connection to being a member of the CIAG. I'm also a member of the Freedom Front Plus. And uh, which is quite surprising considering I'm not Afrikaans, but the party has done a very good job at uh, expanding into uh, other uh, groups in the Western Cape. Uh, and my, my main reason for, for, for supporting the party is because of their pro-independent stance. Uh, but there was a, a summit going on in Irania that I was invited to, and uh, all the, most of the provinces um, were represented there. Uh, so, unfortunately, you know, it's a very unique town, one of the best examples of a self-determination project in South Africa. Um, so I decided, you know, to take the opportunity um, as I had it. And it really is a remarkable town. I mean, you know, they are really trying to be independent from the national government in every way possible. I mean, they're not part of the local municipality. They've got their own distinct legal structure there, which is unique in South Africa. Uh, they're at the, In the moment, and they're in the process of... Um, generating their own electricity with the aim of being uh, completely uh, electricity independent within the next five do you, years. Do you so have reduced step. load shedding there, like in Cape Town, like minus one, minus two? I, I, I think so. Look, it was, it was hard to say when I was in Irania because I don't think there was that much load shedding over that weekend. Uh, but I didn't experience it while I was there. I mean, there was a, well, I think there was a, maybe at one point where there was load shedding. Uh, but either their backup energy system came up online or there was generators that came up online. So we didn't experience it. And luckily, it didn't disrupt the rugby because it would have been quite annoying. If you it watch did. rugby? Um, yeah, we, there was the uh, the Wales uh, South Africa game uh, going. Yeah, yeah, on. but so I mean, do uh, you do you enjoy rugby? Do you watch it? Oh yeah, oh, yeah, I enjoy rugby. Of course, it's uh, it, well, especially for social purposes. It's always nice to go to the local bar and uh, watch, you know watch rugby uh, on a Saturday afternoon. Now we have two Roberts. Yes. Hey, it was, okay. So Robert Diagon, I got yeah, your surname correct. Yeah. So Robert yeah. Diagon, it's nice to have you on Worldview. Um, we're live now, and I'm experimenting with this, but I'm sure it will be great. Robert, um, okay. Diagon and was, King. I think that's the best yeah. way to do this. Diagon and King. Yes. Diagon, what's, what's your... You work for Afri Forum? Yeah, I do. I'm a, I'm a researcher for them. And that's the, the only thing you're doing at the moment in, in terms of a, a profession? Yeah. Okay. Great, great. I know. I just wanted to introduce you. Okay, sorry, uh, King. You can continue with your story on Urania. Uh, yeah. So no, it was just, as I said. It's it's fascinating all the ways they're uh, becoming independent from the national government, uh, and it really um, look. It's, it's and it's controversial, obviously, because of its cultural focus. Um, but it is it is a model that works at the same time. It's you know it's a very successful community. And I think, you know, when we look at the future of South Africa, I mean, it, you know, there's not going to be one model that dominates. I mean, you're going to see a, a large variety of communities forming uh, in the in the chaos that is likely to come. Uh, and some of those will be, you know, cosmopolitan cities like Cape Town, I think will likely thrive. And then you're also going to see, you know, cultural communities develop and grow as well. And I think that's a very positive thing. I, I don't think we should you know, destroy the cultural diversity we have in this country. I think we need to embrace it. And by embracing it, it does require some, you know, a, a variety of communities to form. Mm, mm. And um, okay, so do you see? Did you see signs of improvement and that Urania is growing? That this is something that's really taking off because that's what they're selling, and this is the thing everyone is coming to Urania. Da, 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 da. Well, I mean, so, I was uh, I was invited to speak there as well. And I, actually, if I remember correctly, they had, I mean, last year they had a 10% growth. And the year before that, they had a 32% growth in population. 
so uh, it's it really is quite rapid and it's at the point where um they actually don't have enough labor to do the construction required for for, for new housing demand it's the the it's it's that intense so um i mean the thing is it's a flipping small town and so the expansions that they're planning they're actually you know fortunately they're they're getting on this early but uh you know when i was when i was invited to speak over there um one of the people that they invited was a uh, um was an architect who looked at town planning from a new urbanist perspective in terms of you know mixed area mixed use developments and basically all of that stuff that you that you know leon clear has been pushing for um for a while um and you know so they they're, they're quite thoughtful about this but you know it's it's very real they do have a they do have a labor shortage but then you know that's kind of to be expected i mean you know for for you know nigh on 100 years south africa has been dependent on cheap african labor and so there is slightly sort of a deficit in the white community for lower end as uh, labor capacity um and it is showing up on their on in 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 their economic structure but what is what is I mean, the it is price? also uh, it's it's it's, it's a, sorry, it's, it's a village that's aiming to be a city at the end of the day. I mean, they mm. the, um, the growth rate, I think, for last year was 16%. And they were telling oh, us 16. Uh, Irani has been around for the last 30 years. Uh, and if it continues at the current growth rate it's got for another 30 years, then uh, they're looking at a population size that's about 200,000 people, which is about wow. 100 times larger than what they've currently got. But um, how does that work? So that, how, how does, how does well, Irani become 200,000 people? Yeah, well, look, I mean, I think there's a Go point on. I think where it's you know the growth will start slowing, uh, but uh, it, just, it just goes to show how rapidly it's growing and what their expectations are in the future. You know, it's not going to be a community that's in the few thousands, it's going to be in the tens of thousands, maybe even more. Mm. Dagen? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the I mean, the one thing to bear in mind with all of these things is any kind of organic growth process fits onto a, co a, a sigmoid curve. So it's it's hard to tell exactly what point in the growth trajectory they're at. Um, I would say they're starting to hit the acceleration um, point in the in the lowest lowest end of the curve. If I was to judge by how far they've grown now, so the last thirty years has been that sort of flat little sliver before you hit the hit the major climb. Um, and I, I think they're a very long way from from leveling off in terms of growth. The real question is whether uh, whether that will be interrupted by economic overheating, or whether they'll be able to convert that into um, you know more sustainable manufacturing and uh, and and uh, construction uh, patterns. And then again, they're going to suffer like most rapid growth economies. They're going to suffer a shock once the construction demand has been sated, and they're going to have to convert all of those people into other competencies, which is going to be painful. Um, but uh, you know, if things work out, um, they'll probably be able to swallow that. What What is the price from this <clears throat> trying to sell with Urania? Like, why are they selling Urania in terms of do they want Urania to grow or do they want more Uranias? I think both. Um, I mean, what would you say? No, I have no yeah, idea. Yeah, I think I think it's. I think they really want to promote self determination in general. So whether that means mm -hmm. Irania growing, more Iranias forming, obviously Cape Secession comes into that um, into that equation as well. I mean, that, I think that's the whole point of the Freedom Front Plus now at this point is uh, to be the political uh, political party vehicle to advance the issue of self determination in this country. Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, let me just think if I can find this. So I mean, I wrote a piece for. Um, for Afri Forum, um, just now. Hold on. Uh, I'll share it. I'll share it in the chat over here. Um, but I, I, I wrote. Um, um, I, I wrote this. Uh, I wrote this paper called "Against the Union," and basically the point is that um, the the what's it called? Um, the whole point. The whole problem with South Africa is that there is no sort of natural cultural center. Um, it's, it, it's a purely sort of constructed um, entity that are entirely around, um, entirely built around extracting mineral resources from, from the mining sectors up north. And so it's about binding, 
that mineral industrial sector to the ports uh, in the Cape and Durban. More Durban now than uh, than than the Cape, although you know Saldana and Richards Bay are still big uh, big deals. But you know the, there is no overarching um, you know uh, ethnic dominant uh, dominant group um, anymore. I mean, the, the Afrikaners tried it, but I mean they came under enormous international pressure, and then, and then from below you also have the problem that because during apartheid you saw a radical reduction. Well, not a radical reduction, but actually an increment, a, a sustained incremental reduction, rather would be a better way to characterize it. There's a sustained incremental reduction in economic inequality. So you got got a, a big growth in the black working class and a tiny emerging black middle class, um, especially towards you know the 70s and 80s, and their ability to control that emerging um, that emerging labor force, um, especially in the 1970s, hit an absolute brick wall. And off the Vian report. In 74, I think it was, there was a lot of internal discussion. And by 77, they'd already realized that you can't Afrikaansify the country. And, you know, the, the Afrikaners that they relied on for their support, they couldn't actually uh, they couldn't actually make the sacrifices required to give the Bantustans independence because that would mean eating up big chunks of white South Africa in order to create these contiguous um, economic uh, cultural unities that could survive on their own. And so you, you reach this real sort of ugly, uh, ugly realization after a, uh, after a point that um, South Africa as a political entity cannot survive without destroying or dominating some some ethnic element within it. Um, and, you know, it's inevitable. Uh, the It began as the subjugation of the Afrikaners, continued as the subjugation of um, of black people in general. And is now emerging as a sort of universal subjugation, where a tiny emergent, um, uh, rootless black cosmopolitan group, which uh, the um, philosopher—I forget his first name—his surname is Gobeni, uh from the nineteen seventies referred to them as the New Africans, which is you know um, Africans of various backgrounds have been transformed through contact with the white economy and have lost their institutional roots. So they form this new sort of ethnic, you know, mix. Um, they're dominating. Uh, they're dominating now amongst the elite, but they again don't have any sort of deep cultural um, roots or substance to go on with. Um, and what they do is they they ruthlessly undermine the traditional governance structures in rural areas. They're discriminating against all racial minorities as well, and it's it's all to maintain this very sort of synthetic um, po a, a central political economy that's required to sustain that mineral industrial uh, complex. And you think and, you know, and you think that would be true under a federal or a confederal system as well. Yeah, I mean that's why everyone's resisting it because uh, there there is no um there's no major power that has uh, has serious interest in doing anything for um ordinary South Africans that would benefit him. There there just isn't one. And um I think I mean I know that a lot of people who I work with don't like me speaking as bluntly about like this uh, about the DA but they have no interest in delivering federalism. And I think the, the, the proof is in the pudding. They've had it on their manifesto for nearly 20 years. They haven't lifted a single finger to devolve any powers until Jordan Hill Lewis got control of Cape Town. And even then, it's like, you know, piecemeal stuff. Like, um, you know, maybe they'll get a few minis a few extra municipal police in the, in, in the metro cops. Yeah. Or, um, the the Dagen, they've, they've taken control of the cemeteries now. So oh, yeah, yeah, really yeah. Large. But I mean, it's uh, it, it's staggering because they're saying, "Oh well, we can only deliver. We can't do anything about federalism because you know we're not in central government. We have no control. The NC would block us." But the reality is, I mean, look, I've just spent two months with my head buried in um, in you know um, legal documents and um, and uh, and the constitution and all kinds of stuff. They they've got enormous powers to devolve various sectors sectors of uh, of the uh, of the government. Um, uh, sweetie, you on camera now. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, anyhow, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so anyhow, <laughs> the um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> she's very beautiful. Um, thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm sure she'll be glad to hear that. 
Because you still got the, um, you know, those sort of like moisturizing stickers that you put on your face when you're you know, taking a bath. Anyhow, uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. So I've been busy on this report on like uh, the capacity for devolving power. I mean, there's all kinds of creative shit that the, the, the uh, DA could have done. Take, for example, schooling. So they've got no control over the public schooling very, very much. I mean, you look at that bill and it's like, here are the areas where, you know, the minister has exclusive control. It's like this huge laundry list that covers anything of importance. On the other hand, they have the power to, um, uh, they have the power to fund private schools, dictate exactly what the private schools are going to do with that funding. Um, and the private schools are actually forbidden uh, from racial discrimination in an absolute sense by legislature which means that you uh, they actually cannot have BEE in any school admissions policy in a private school. So the DA could have actually completely revamped, like, you know, decades ago, they could have completely revamped the entire Western Cape education system. Um, I mean, the same goes for the police. They have the power to actually institute a, a, a municipally run, a municipal level run police force that spans the entire province, um, but they don't do it. So like, and, and here's the thing, they could, oh, we, you know, we don't have control of the budget. Well, the reality is that any function that is devolved to the, uh, to the provincial level, the, the national government is mandated to provide the funds for it. So if they gain control of any kind of function over, um, uh, which is formerly a government function, they, a, a national function, they, the government has to, has to back it in the, in the annual budget. So there's just literally no argument that they really have for doing nothing and sitting on their hands for two decades, except for the fact that their plan, um, as has been revealed recently, um, it was, all along was, you know, build up to 20, 25%, wait for the ANC to collapse, then form a coalition with them, an international government. I mean, it's, it's, it's why the Brenthurst Foundation, which is the um, uh, main think tank for the Oppenheimer family's uh, mining interest, has been you know, has been backing this kind of thing, and the and the Oppenheimer family have been dumping millions into the DA coffers. I mean, look, leadership over there will insist it has no impact on them. Like, you know, you gave us fifteen million, and it uh, occupies a giant portion of our uh, of our funding. But of course, they have no influence whatsoever. I mean, it's absolute nonsense. It's um, and but the silliest part about this is not so much the um the the skullduggery. It's more that there's no chance of success. You know, I mean, who is their, they, 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 they sort of have this idea that Ramaphosa was the reasonable wing of the ANC. I mean, anyone who's watched his, uh, um, his shenanigans for the past couple of years can realize this, it's nonsense. <laughs> you, you can't call Ramaphosa's group reasonable. They're people who lie through their teeth, have no principles, and steal at a rate that makes Jacob Zuma look like, you know, like a DA member. I mean, the, the only thing that the DA really has going for them is more that they don't steal everything that isn't nailed down. They're competent because they don't they hire people in a very ordinary way according to their basic skills and a bit of political allegiance, and they don't steal everything. Now, those are huge things in their favor, but it, it, it means that they're governing at sort of like um, parity for what you'd expect uh, given, the, given the Human Development Index for, uh, for the Western Cape. Um, and it's it's really very sad because they could you know this whole place could be doing so much better if they had if if they really cared about the western cape who've been loyal to them for 20 odd years um in in more ways than one and i think it, it's just extremely depressing um so the, the, I mean, the people of the western cape are waking up to this i mean they they're voting for the good party yeah, the, well, no, the, the, that's not waking up. Voting for the good party is a sign of brain disease. Uh, the good party is literally a part of the ANC. The, the, Patricia DeLille is a cabinet minister. I mean, anyone who votes for the good party is a category A idiot. Uh, there's no other way to gloss over it. it there's just no other way. Or like, uh, it can be a category B idiot as well. Um, King, you want to... Well, look, I mean, the Good Party was incredibly hypocritical leading up into the local elections because I remember uh, Brett Heron uh, tweeting a graphic that warned that the DA would get into bed with the ANC after the local government elections, completely oblivious to the fact that they've got a minister in the current cabinet. But, you know, it was apparently... Well, he's not oblivious, he's just a liar. Hmm. Yeah, he's, yeah, just but a he's liar. not oblivious, no, he's just a liar. Um, 
But I mean, he's. It's also the, yeah, like, I mean, the, it's, the it's, DA it's, has it's, had it's, no it's, plans it's, to go into bed with the ANC at the munis uh, at the local level. Their plan for years now um, has been to go in with the ANC at the national level, because I mean, look, as, I mean, Helen's had actually a lot outlined this like really, really clearly. There was a conference you did with Business a while back. Um, I I'm trying to remember the title of it. Uh, it's I think it's called like you know the battle. Yeah, it's called the battle for the soul of South Africa. That's the title. So if you look it up on YouTube, you'll see it. And she outlines this plan where 2024 comes around, ANC dips below 50%. And there's two ways that, uh, that that can end up. One, they go into coalition with the EFF. Or two, they go into coalition with the DA. With the DA. And then for some reason, she decides that, that she can't bring herself to say, our plan is to go into coalition with the ANC. Instead, she says, under no circumstances can they be allowed to go into coalition with the EFF and then leaves everyone to fill in the blanks. So, I mean, I'm, I'm struggling to see how there's any way of interpreting. I mean, she got very angry at me because we had a very cordial conversation uh, at the beginning of this year where I tried to convince her not to do this and to back Cape Independence. And she immediately came up with, um, uh, you know, that the ANC, that, that this would result in civil war, which I think, you know, it's absurd because I've had a look at, if, if anyone has watched what happened last year in KZN, it's impossible. First of all, the, the ANC, there's only two forces that could possibly wage war against the Western Cape. Number one is the ANC, and number two, uh, and number two is the state. Now, the ANC can't get anyone together to protest in this part of the country, uh, as last year showed. And second of all, they don't even have enough to, um, to pull together an, uh, a provincial conference uh, anymore. They've got nothing here. And... Um, in terms of the state, the state has demonstrated that they cannot even feed and water their troops for two weeks on an internal urban deployment after the rioting has fucking gone uh, gone down. So the state is so completely impotent that the only thing that you really require in order to flout the laws of the Na uh, South African government is a pair of testicles. Um, and frankly, I mean, I'd, it, it just shows how short supply that stuff is. Um, I, 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 I don't you know. You can what to buy say. it. Testicles. Can buy what? No, you can't buy testicles. Uh, okay. But it, okay. You can buy sheep like testicles, which I hear are good if deep fried, but I, 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 I can't. I couldn't uh, attest to that. King, you were interrupted. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, look, I, I, I forgot what the point I was going on about, but yeah, I mean, look, um, the. Uh, yeah, look, I, look it's, it's unclear what, what the DA position really now is on the ANC coalition because they've actually proven uh, to be completely lying about the topic. Um, uh, after this uh, Fala Fala gate uh, broke, uh, Helen Zilla came out with a tweet and said, um, we were considering a, a coalition with the ANC uh, and now we're not. Uh, but obviously they've been lying about that for months before that tweet and we don't know if they're lying months afterwards. So it's it's a very uh, unclear situation we're in right now. Um, but the only thing that's really clear is that for the Western Cape, the only safe political option for us is Cape independence. I mean, people always, I mean, the most likely outcome after the uh, next elections, if it isn't an ANC DA coalition, which would be a disaster, um, as Rob's pointed out in the past, uh, is an ANC EFF coalition. And even in the last local elections, which everyone held as a, a massive victory uh, in the fight against the ANC, I mean, the ANC and EFF together nationwide got 56% of the vote. And this multi-party opposition alliance that everyone's so uh, optimistic about got 34% of the vote. So there's still a massive gap between those two coalitions. And, you know, I can't, and, and considering in local elect, often the national elections after local elections, that the governing party actually improves on its performance. Um, I'm not confident at all that those two parties are going to go under 50% of the vote. Okay, gentlemen, yeah. you, you right. gave us the solution, Cape Independence. So what do we do? How do we achieve it? What what needs to be done? What do you think is lacking still to achieve Cape well, Independence? There's literally only one thing that's in the way, and that's the DA. I mean, let, let's be frank. I mean, as I outlined, the ANC doesn't really have a way to stop that in practical terms. But let's say you don't want to be the kind of guy who's breaking laws and violating the constitution. You want to do things in a legal way. Well, there is a way to do it. You 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 write a, a, a provincial bill that declares the uh, that recognizes the Cape's um, 
inherently different uh, cultural and communal character. And that will establish under several treaties that the uh, ANC has ratified as leaders of the government uh, in um, defense of self-determination. So that gives us the right to self-determination. Once you have the right to self-determination, you can demand um, pretty much uh, pretty much any powers you want back from the national government. If they don't give it to you um, and refuse to uh, and put you know absurd conditions on you achieving them, um, then you you have the right to, to secede using something called remedial secession. So under international law, there's there, there's a fairly firm basis for all of this. Um, and then all you need to do is build the legitimacy for it um, locally. I mean, you know, what I find really peculiar about uh, a lot of the arguments that people put forward for, uh, you know, against Cape Independence is they'll say, oh, well, you know, there's lots of people who don't want Cape Independence. I mean, look, we know that most people who want Cape Independence are DA voters. They don't want to vote for another party because they're scared of the DA losing and then getting some kind of charterist monstrosity. Um so, you know, the, the, real, the real sort of obstacle here is, <laughs> is not so much the support. It's like convincing the remainder to, to, to go over. And the, the, the funny thing for me is that, you know, you've got DA members who, who, uh, and DA supporters who really think that the DA can convert the entire country of, you know, national socialists, tribalists, communists into English liberals. And I find that to be the most like profoundly absurd proposition uh, that I've ever heard any political, any serious political party or political thinker ever float. Um, and so, you know, the, the only way that the DA will be able to maintain control of the government for any serious period of time, for even a single electoral cycle, is if they abandon all their liberal principles completely. Um, and th th then what's the point of voting for them as a minority? Um, you're just going to get another ANC. So either either they completely get rid of all of their values, or they um, or they just don't make it. And the reality is, if they go into coalition with the ANC, they're going to be a junior partner because anytime they push something the ANC doesn't like, the ANC can go, "Hang on, guys, look, we don't really want to do this. And if you want to play hardball, we've always got the EFF waiting in the in the wings, and we can just do them, you know." Uh, and, and I, think, I mean, like, I, I just like the levels of insanity that are that are required to entertain the idea that South Africa is a sustainable, um, multicultural, you know, liberal democracy. I, I cannot understand it. I, I can't. I mean, if you take if you look at it seriously for five minutes, it's it's a, it's a transparent fallacy. King. What's yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's very, South Africa is a very, well, look, I mean, an important, look, I agree with Rob's point uh, completely, yeah, but another important point is also uh, getting it on the ground, the, the troops on the ground uh, pushing this forward as well. I mean, that is, has something been something that we've been lacking for a long period of time. We've had a very good, um, uh, you know, st uh, strategy with the CIG and Cape Exit uh, to getting the mandates and getting the, the political uh, players to, to discussing the topic. Um, but at the same time, we need the people on the ground going into communities uh, campaigning for this as well. And that is something that I think we will start to be seeing in the next few months. Uh, we've got actually, uh, Rob and I, are working on a, uh, a project at the moment to um, boost youth involvement in Cape Independence as well, building an activist base of uh, young Cape Independence supporters. And we should be getting some awareness events on some of the university campuses within the next few weeks uh, on that. Um, but the, I think, you know, one of the important things is getting more people to be active in the independence movement uh, and making sure that we've got a, you know, activists that can help us in election campaigns, getting the word out and, in, and in eventually in a referendum campaign as well. Hmm. I would just yeah. advise Chris Wyatt in the comments. I think it's better that he plans this South African trip. Than spending too much time in the comments, but yes, Miss Dagen. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, no, Chris Chris Wyatt is. Uh, if you don't know who he is, he's um, he's a very senior retired um, American um, military officer, and he is very well acquainted with Southern Africa as an area. Um, he speaks several native languages, um, and he speaks several European languages, and uh, he's very well acquainted with this part of the world. So. Um, I think um, 
I think I think his comments are, his comments are not to be taken lightly at the very least. Yeah, um, I can, if not, I don't. I'm a, I'm a very sarcastic person. I, I right. Don't Oh okay. oh, okay, good. Sorry, I'm. I, I can be a bit, you know, uh, literal-minded sometimes. Okay, but do you, do you guys don't think? Don't you think another political party is part of the the solution, right? Because I think to a certain degree, people don't feel comfortable placing their DA votes with another party that just supports independence. Yeah. The other parties are too focused on minor issues, like. The Cape yeah. Color Congress might be focused on colored issues, so that the Freights from Plus focuses on Afrikaans issues. Then there's yeah. this sort of this middle way that they don't really feel comfortable placing their votes with these parties. Isn't there, shouldn't we need another party in the Western Cape that just expressly focuses on Cape independence? Well, I think so. I mean, I think the thing is that um, uh, there is a lot, I mean, I think the majority of people in the Cape don't like sectional race politics. And I think that's people of all persuasions. I think that's kind of part of what makes the Cape a bit different is the the desire to get away of race na from race nationalism is felt across racial boundaries. It's the only place where that's true. Um, and so, yeah, I, there's there's a lot of there, there, there's a lot of uh, gap for that. I think the 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 real the real thing is that one has to realize that um, again. Not a lot of people, even if they support Cape Independence, are willing to risk ducking out of the DA. Um, but, I mean, the DA is also hemorrhaging support in the Western Cape. So at one point, they were, over, they were I think, over 70% of the vote. And now they're just bumping up above, you know, 50% by a couple of digits. And, you know, that's dangerous territory because there's a, there's a non-zero chance that in 2024, even if even if nothing changes, even if there's no new parties on the horizon, that they're going to fall below 50% and have to go into coalition. I mean, they're probably going to pick Freys from Plus because, um, you know, they're a fairly reliable lot that don't do anything brash. Um, and they're, you know, they don't, um, they're not sort of known for skullduggery. But uh, um, they're still going to have to go into coalition. And it's, you know, any any sort of really good entrepreneurial party who's capable of scraping together the funds and um, and capable of canvassing the uh, uh, just even decently. Um, they don't have to be work a miracle. They just have to do some decent canvassing. They could steal between five and ten percent of the election at uh, uh, at a provincial level if they really try, and that's going to, that would immediately force the DA to play ball on Cape Independence because they would have no choice. Um, because then you'd have three um, pro Cape and uh, pro independence parties that constitute a block of like you know nearly twenty percent of the vote with which the DA is going to have to do business, and then it comes down to can we get the referendum done um, in a reasonable time frame? So that's really that's really that's really what I, my answer to the whole party question, King. Oh, no, I would agree with that as, uh, as well. I mean, look, we do need a, a party that can appeal to the... A lot, look, a lot of the parties are relatively conservative orientated, and you do need a party that can appeal to the uh, liberal majority in the Cape. But I think if you look at the election results as well, you definitely see quite a divergence between the uh, interior of the Cape, of the Western Cape and Cape Town. Um, in Cape Town, the Freedom Front Plus, for example, only got about 1% or 2% of the vote. And then in the in the rest of the province, they were getting in places like my municipality eight percent of the vote. In the Langeberg municipality, they got about ten percent of the vote, and in Otter, and they got twelve percent of the vote. So clearly, there is a big split there politically um, between those between those two areas. Um, and I think if we look at the the polling results from the CIAG, I think from both twenty 2020 twenty and uh, twenty twenty one, I think there's between fifteen and twenty percent of respondents who said they would be uh, less likely uh, to support the DA if they took a uh, anti-independence position. So you're talking about 10% of the, about 10 of the electorate that would be uh, open to supporting a pro-independence party there. So yes, it, it comes into line with what Rob says. Uh, and you really do need a, basically a political party that can appeal to every major demographic in the Western Cape. And the Freedom Front Plus has their demographics that they really appeal to, which is uh, you know, Africa. Voters and 
increasingly uh, voters. Uh, and then we've got the Cape Coloured Congress that does very well in urban coloured areas. Uh, and then you've got the Cape Independence Party that really doesn't do well in, in any area. Um, so you, you do need a political party that can appeal to the, the majority of people in the province. Why is that? Why doesn't the Cape Independence Party do so well? Well, it's, they, they take quite a libertarian approach, which, um, you know, look, the, the, the Western Cape is, uh, you know, more capitalistic than the rest of the country, but they're not libertarian. Uh, so uh, I think that I think that's one of the main problems with the Cape Independence Party, and also their imaging. There's there's many issues with their imaging. Uh, I, I spoke to some people who were considering voting for them prior to the uh, local elections, and they just uh, were quite disappointed with how the party was presenting themselves. They didn't consider it to be a serious electoral alternative, and I think they ended up voting for the DA, unfortunately. So I think mm. I think it's uh, you know it's. Uh, They've, they've got a lot of potential, but unfortunately, I feel like they squander it a lot of the time as well. Yeah, no, I mean, I also, I, I, I've also been very disappointed by, um, you know, I, I had a conversation with Jack Miller about, um, I mean, I'm not going to go into details because I feel like, I feel like divulging too much of a private phone call would be, you know, would be not right. But uh, I remember I asked him about, you know, is there anything that you would have done differently in your campaign? And he felt that they'd just sort of tried everything. And you know, I kind of don't think that's true. I mean, personally, from from my perspective, I think that, that they could work a better on a lot of optics, a lot of um, online presentation. You know, they could be a bit tighter in their public communication on many channels. They're not good at playing the media. Um, I mean, there's some basic stuff like mastering media packages and stuff like that they could be a bit better at. Um, so... I, I don't know. I, I don't think they have tried everything, um, and I think uh, I, I think that you know they could do a lot better, and it's it's very sad because it kind of lets the movement down. Um, but uh, yeah, we are where we are, and I mean it's been the biggest drag on it because you can do as many polls as you like, and it's I, I, I think there's a difference between states of preference and revealed preference because. You know, everyone kind of likes the idea of Cape Independence, but if they have no confidence that it's ever going to happen, they're not going to bother to take that that leap, because there is a price to pay, um, at least in terms of risk. It's it's the one of saying, well, I mean, I could try and do this whole Cape Independence thing, but it could also be a lock, uh, and uh, the DA then takes a hit, and you know, they get closer to negotiating with parties that I don't want anything to do with. But you know? but on that point, that's the trade off everyone's making. Shouldn't you sell it like Courtney Mulder is doing? That's saying there's nothing to lose by doing it either way. You can you can that's true. fight for South Africa. But I mean, again, independence. <laughs> no, that's 100 percent true. I mean, like I, the thing is, you know, there's there's a rational, there's always a rational argument you can make. I mean, I can make, I can point out reality all I like, but you know, it's getting people to 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 understand the electoral system. Um, and to trust what is literal, uh, what is true about the electoral system, rather than their gut feelings, that's a very, very difficult process. Uh, and I mean, even with one individual, never mind with people on mass. And so, I mean, I think, uh, I think people have to realize that this, there is an uphill battle, even if there is a majority that supports Cape Independence, which I think there is, because I can, I, I, I honestly can say, since I've lived in the Cape, I've met maybe one or two people in total in in person that have anything negative to say about cape independence in principle the only objection and the one that almost everyone has is yeah but it won't happen because the anc wouldn't let us so then why bother and it's you know it's it's difficult to convince them actually that's not true here's why here's a process this this and this because they have to learn all of the stuff about like you know what the constitution's like and what international law is uh, what the what the material strength of the ANC's armed forces are, what the what the national military looks like, and no one's got the time for that. If you sit and explain that to someone who's got zero political knowledge or like you know just normie, um, I prefer DA over ANC kind of knowledge, then you know that conversation is at least half an hour um, to, to to get them up to speed on here's why Cape Independence is possible, and so even if people want it to happen. It's precisely that belief that it's in, in, impossible that is preventing them from acting, even in, in a tri as trivial a place as the ballot box. So, you know, that's really the hurdle is trying to raise awareness of the windows of opportunity. But on that note, isn't there also the problem 
defeating the DA in the Western Cape also involves explaining to people all these technicalities that the DA isn't doing right. I mean, how do you sell that message that the Democratic Alliance is screwing up in the Western Cape? Because it involves... Well, I wouldn't go as far as screwing up. I wouldn't go as far as screwing up. I think that's an important point. Look, they're doing sort of... They're doing a competent job. I don't want to go as far as to say they're doing a terrible job. They're doing a competent job. Let's let's not be funny. They're the best political party in the country. No one no one can doubt that. Um, anyone who's remotely rational can recognize it. Um, but the thing is, are they? Is that good enough? Is the best we've got to offer good enough? Because I mean, the challenges that we're going to face right now as a uh, I don't want to say as a nation because South Africa isn't a, isn't a nation, but as the country. We're all going to face the fact that we are heading towards a cultural revolution amongst the black population. Okay, at the street level, you've got things like put South Africa first. You've got the Operation Dudula. That's a very, very sort of um, influential movement, and you're seeing a massive transformation of um, of broad uh, broad swathes of black society in, in our generation towards ideas of black consciousness. And then amongst those who have university education. Most of the, uh, a great deal of them, I wouldn't say most because actually I have no idea what the proportion is. But there's a good portion of the proportion of people who have gone to universities and even larger if they've gone to the elite universities who are believers in sort of blood and soil genocidal nationalism. And, you know, I'm talking about not just EFF supporters, but, you know, just any kind of common var uh, garden variety, take back the land type of guy, regardless of whether they support... Um, PAC or um, even the even the ANC Youth League are, are, are of this flavor now at the universities. The um, not the ANC Youth League, uh, Sasco, same thing really, uh, practically speaking. But um, I mean, like the good indicator of this shit is, you know, when I was when I was at UCT, it was the point where, you know, you get people who are calling for genocide, and there's like not a single person that you can find to speak to or say that there's anything wrong with doing that. Um, and, you know, even, even if that cohort has passed away and the next one are more moderate, which I'd have to go, go and talk to people to find out, you've got a huge cohort uh, at a national level because the fullest movement was at a national level. You've got a massive cohort of young people who are going to be passing into leadership who dominate the discourse, have nobody who's challenging them on this, these kinds of issues, um, who are dragging the whole country towards... Um, sort of a nationalist revolution of the kind that you sort of saw in Europe in the 19th century, in the early 20th century. Um, it's it, it's sort of a confrontation of who are we. Um, and, I mean, one must remember that, okay, well, South Africa is not really a nation. But then if you look back at Europe in the, in the 19th century, those weren't nations either. They were, um, you know, royal fiefdoms that encompassed several ethnicities who felt that they were fairly distinct but didn't question the idea of who they were until the national question emerged as a, as a violent proposition. And so we're not hitting that stage, and there's no discussion. Um, everyone understands that black people are inside that nation, and everyone else is a conditional member, or if you're white, completely outside of it. And that makes you a moral externality to any political violence or um, property appropriation that occurs in that process. And that process can last for a good couple of decades. And it's about to hit us, you know, by the end of the decade. So what shape that will take, how fast it will move, what it will look like, I, I don't know. But it's not going to be pretty. And it's going to take a lot of stuff with it. And it's going to take a lot of people down with it. And, the, you know, it's, it's, it, these are such slow-moving social forces. They're not things that you can slam reverse on. You can't just run a really effective political campaign and say, no, Okay, guys, we're all going to get along. We're going to be fluffy internationalist liberals now. Not a bloody damn. I mean, even if you look at the moderate end of um, black South African nationalism, and that's Action SA, they're the moderates, right? They're the most moderate party. Even they are fairly hard, uh, hardcore nationalist types. And they are not against uh, racial discrimination at all. In fact, they think that it's fine. It just needs to be enforced better. Um, so... You know what are you really dealing with here? You're dealing with you're dealing with a wave of change that ha that can only be ducked. It can't be challenged because, you know, even if every minority in the country stood together, we're, we're too small. Mm. So I um, want to bring in King here. But I think I also, know, yeah, is he still here? But okay, sorry, Dagen. Yeah, Robert, are you still there, man? 
Yeah. The I mean the, the the real issue is the wave of black consciousness that started in the mid twentieth uh, century. It was remarked by there's a lot of very decent. I mean even guys even though I disagree with the guys on many points, there's a very very decent political thinkers in in the black consciousness tradition who've noted some of these trends as early as the nineteen seventies. Um, and I think I, I mean like Biko is certainly part of it, but I don't think he was as um, he wasn't as descriptive of uh, of a change as he was prescriptive of it. So he said, well, this ought to happen. Um, but you don't get to see um, a real description of what's happening materially and spiritually with the nation, um, I think, until you get to Ngobani. Um, or is it Ngobani? I haven't, I, haven't seen, I haven't read the paper in a while, so I'm forgetting the man's surname. Would you, would you describe Operation Nadula as a black consciousness movement? Is it more of like a, just a vigilante organization? No, no, no. They, look, I, I, I think one has to be careful. I don't want to say, I don't want to say like they're literally a black consciousness movement. Like that's they're just a continuation of BCP. That's not true. But they share a lot of ties with them. They they're based in you know um, the core of the old uh, BCP neighborhoods, and um, uh, you know Biko is as usual highly influential. I mean, you got to remember, you know, Biko was the ally of uh, British and American intelligence. And so their members were tortured by the ANC for that reason, tortured and murdered en masse uh, for that reason, even if they fled mean, overseas. What do you mean with ally? Sorry. Is, who, who, who what do you ally? mean with oh. ally? Okay. Well, what you can see is, I mean, there's, there's scant records of this, but what you'll notice is that the Church of England, which uh, overseas is often um, the playgrounds of uh, MI5 and MI6 operators, that was how black consciousness was initiated, was through the Anglican Church in South Africa as a movement. And uh, it was largely designed and orchestrated by, you know, white bishops uh, who, who, you know, uh, whose names, uh, again, me and names. But, um, and then later on, the Americans got involved. So you've got, in 1975, you've got the United States Information Agency uh, opening up a branch in Soweto in the 70s and starting to show um, all kinds of propaganda to black youths in order to rile them up and sharing ideas on how to organize and so on. So it was within a year you see the emergence of this enormous student movement. Not that it hadn't been building for some time, but um, it was a major step change once the Americans got involved. And if you ask any sort of old ANC cadre, the, first, the one thing that they kept going on about was that the, the black consciousness movement was a tool of the CIA, which is why they went out of their way to capture, torture, and convert them. If a BCP member went, went to the UN High Commission of Refugees when they hit Tanzania or wherever, uh, because the ANC had infiltrated the UNHCR um, you know, by virtue of their Russian connections, um, what would happen is they would be picked up and they'd be sent to Camp Quattro to be reformed. Um, so, you know, the, the, I mean, not to say that the Americans were, were doing right or wrong by what they were getting involved in, but, um, it's just that there's those dynamics as well. So the, the split, the, the, there's, there's unfinished business between those who follow black consciousness and those who follow the ANC, even though there's much overlap. So, um, so essentially you're saying is that, uh, Chris Wyatt is responsible for Steve Baker. But, oh yeah, him personally must be him. Um, <laughs> no, but, but, uh, but I, again, I, sorry, I, I want to bring in King back here. King, yeah, please, uh, please, please go ahead. King, is there, is there any a plan to um, to create another Cape Independence Party? There's discussions within a number of different groups, but uh, I don't think there's any concrete plans as of yet. Um, and it's because, look, creating a political party is, is, is a good idea, but it's also a very difficult thing to do. I mean, it requires an immense amount of resources, an immense amount of dedicated people. And uh, I mean, they also don't necessarily get a, it's, it's difficult to get a large share of the vote with new parties. I mean, take good as an example. I mean, they got about two or three percent of the vote in the last elections. I mean, even take an established party like the Freedom Front Plus. And they only got three percent of the vote. The EFF got four percent. So it is. It's it's very difficult to make a breakthrough, uh, and it takes a lot of resources. So um, I think we will um, see one emerge, but it will require dedicated people to bring it through. Uh, and look, I think you know, regardless of whether a new party is launched, I think with the 
people that are currently prepared to vote for pro-independence parties, I think we will see uh, the DA go below 50% in the next elections in the province. Uh, speaking to Freedom Front Plus members, they seem very optimistic about the possibility of the DA going below 50% and having to go into coalition with them. But uh, we, we don't want to just base this on uh, optimism and uh, we, we actually want to, to make this uh, a certainty. Uh, and I think a, a new party would ensure that. You're a member now of the Freights from Plus. Do you think they're doing enough in the Western Cape to convince voters to their side? Has, has, has Peter Grunewald ever been in a township? I'm not that sure about Peter Grunewald. I mean, like I, I've campaigned with Peter Murray, for example, in my in in, in the townships of uh, of the of the Rebeck Valley. So I, I've I've been campaigning there. I, I think I think they are doing a lot, but there is a number of challenges with them. Firstly, I mean, they are a minority party. They are a party that has a key focus on uh, Afrikaans-based minorities, which means that they probably have the best opportunities in the Western Cape. I mean, this is the only majority Afrikaans-speaking province, province as far as I know. Um, but at the same time, they've got that baggage of the Freedom Front Plus. They've got the baggage of the 90s. Uh, and that's always going to, uh, you know, um, be a, be a problem for them. So I look, I, I support the Freedom Front Plus personally, but I, I don't think they are going to be the primary political vehicle to drive Cape independence forward. I think we do need a, a purpose-built political party that can appeal to a, a large uh, chunk of the Western Cape population. I think the Freedom Front Plus will do a great job at appealing to voters in uh, in the rural in the rural parts of the province. But I think especially in uh, in in the in the city of Cape Town, you're going to need a new vehicle there. Yeah. yeah, that's true. And should this person, should this party be led by a white person, a colored person, a black person? Does it matter if it's a white person, a colored person, or a black person? Does does race matter? Hmm. I I think I think look, race always matters in in politics. Identity always matters. There's no avoiding it. But I think that in this particular case, um, you know, even if it's a white person leading it, you can make certain um. You can make certain allowances. Um, you you'll make you'll make certain allowances to um, that, like for example, you could say the party will dissolve itself um, once um, the referendum is held, or once you know secession is achieved, um, and that you know that'll go a long way to mitigating um, some of the distrust involved. Um, but I mean. It, there's, you know, it's it's going to be whoever is actually ready to do it. Um, I hope you don't mind if I just quickly address a couple of comments in the in the comment thing because I can be very sure. quick. Um, just because Chris Wyatt's a very sort of reputable man, and him uh, sort of uh, his little comment about what I said about the black consciousness movement, I thought I'd quickly address because um, the the thing is, like, I also thought it was uh, it was absurd. But um, I actually, I, I actually got pointed to this by someone. Um, he pointed to sort of actual um, original documents. So I found I, I, that you can actually find online. So I found the um, the budget hearing for the uh, for the U.S. Uh, information agency for 1975, and then there was a U.S. information agency retrospective that mentioned the reading room that they uh, had um, in Soweto. And then I read a couple of memos of people who worked with them from the 1970s who mentioned the propaganda process that they exposed the people to on the ground. Um, so coupled with the comments from, you know, um, sort of, old, uh, you, you know, from, from the sources used by Anthea Jeffrey to describe the, 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 the process of persecution between the two groups, um, I sort of figured that there's enough corroboration for it to basically be true. Um, that's what I sort of reach. And then the flip-flopping in terms of American foreign policy, um, I kind of understand it because of different departments that behave differently. And America, like everyone else, really wanted South Africa to break open and release a lot of its um, assets to international investment. Um, and America's reason for backing, for tolerating the South African regime is largely as a bulwark against the, the Soviets. And um, the Soviets only became a threat between 1979 and 19, um, and um, well, until the Soviet Union developed. I mean, sorry, in South Africa, they only became a pertinent power in South Africa from 1979. So that whole period beforehand, you're going to see you, you saw you saw a lot of funny, multi-dimensional involvement from foreigners um, towards civil civil liberties groups. 
Um, and then the other comment briefly about, you know, why is uh, Biko's pan-Africanist movement becoming, you know, nationalist over here? Well, it's not actually much of a, it's, it's not much of a development. You, you know, you don't have to, most people understand that you don't have to be purely doctrinaire um, about things. And people who don't go to university and learn um, sort of rigorous ideological formulae tend to think much more pragmatically about their influences. So you can be as influenced by Biko as you want, and then you just go, well, we've also got this very sort of obvious practical problem of foreigners in front of us. And, you know, we the, the main thing of self-sufficiency and self-determination is actually and not involving themselves in party politics is actually the, what I would see as the biggest influence there. But I'm um, sorry for going off topic. I just thought... Yeah, no problem. But uh, my question is, who is funding this Operation Dadula? I mean, this what's what's his name, Mr. Lux? Then he is in Johannesburg. Then he is in Cape Town. Then he is in Durban. The next day, I mean, this guy is flying around, and every day he's on ENCA. I mean, it, it, it feels to me there's some money behind this. Or am I crazy? Well, then there well, might be. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, maybe you know, maybe the ANC's funneling some money there to try and do, you know, because I look, I think Operation Tadula does an, a fantastic job at uh, almost distracting from a lot of the ANC's failures. I mean, it's quite easy to put a lot of these issues, just blame them on immigration and not on the disastrous economic policy of the ANC over the last few decades. So, uh, you know, and, and, and I think um, Mr. Lux has said himself that uh, they have uh, got ministers that they, they talk to. So I, I'm not sure. I don't want to spread any conspiracies, but... Um, uh, well, I, I'm sure, I, look... I, 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 I agree. I agree with you. It's, it's, you know, it's hard to tell. But I mean, I think um, uh, the, the, yeah, uh, I, th I think the big thing with Enchantra uh, likes is I'm sure there are several people who throw money at him. And I don't just mean the ANC. Like if, if, you're, if you're an influential political mover and shake in South Africa and you look like you're going to change the status quo, people are going to approach you and try and offer you a few things. Um, and I think, um, I, I, I just looking at his social media, because when he first popped up, I was quite surprised, you know, that there was something as new and fresh as him popping along. So, you know, I listened to interviews about his life story and I listened to interviews about uh, to what he said about his intellectual influences, his social influences. And, you know, I mean, his, his father was a, a very powerful and wealthy gangster. Um, so he understands, uh, and, and he said he, he, he learned a lot from him. So, uh, there's a lot of that sort of very streetwise approach to things, and he's very, very good at networking. So you'll see who he appears on. He'll appear with Rob Hasselhoff. He'll appear with hmm. um, sort of uh, wealthy Jew members of the Jewish community. He'll appear with wealthy members of the Afrikaner community. He will appear with politicians from all sides of the um, all sides of the divide. The only people he really doesn't like now are the EFF. But you'll notice that until they had that clash over the drug dealing. They were actually very friendly, and he would congratulate mm. Julius Malone on every sort of thing. I saw yeah. an interview with uh, done on with him on Hustlers Corner. It's a YouTube podcast, and in that interview, he said there was a point in time where he literally verbatim memorized Julius Malema's speeches. He literally, mm. and he was part of a group that. I mean, he was he was clearly a massive fan of Julius Malema. I don't know if that's still true to this very day, or if this entire immigration thing made them fall out, but. There's definitely something there. Well, I mean, you'll notice that, look, Julius Malema was for open borders and pan-Africanism, which anybody with an ounce of sense can tell is a stupid idea. Um, but he was for it right up until the point that it became a, a liability for his electoral uh, sort of success. And then he said, uh, and then he started pulling those stunts with, you know, restaurant owners, how many, you know, foreigners are you employing and all that? Um, you know, I, I don't know. Um it's 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 hard to tell, um, but I think um, oh sure, but I'm uh, my my I just pulled a blank. Um, sorry, about that. <laughs> sorry about that. I've floated away. Um, no problem, no else. But gentlemen, it's it's eight o'clock. Do you see hope? Do you see hope for Cape Independence? Do you see something happening in the future that's actually gonna really make this happen, King? 
Look, I'm, I'm quite optimistic. I'm, I'm a bit like Phil. I mean, he's he's always quite optimistic about Cape Independence, uh, and, and I share that. Um, look, I think there's a lot of things that are in behind the scenes at the moment going on that will really change uh, the, the dynamics of Cape Independence uh, and really uh, bring this more into becoming a reality. Um, but mm. yeah, I, look, I, I definitely think there's... Um, reasons to be optimistic for this uh, there's a, you know the cape has um a lot of potential you know it's got great people and i think it's got a great future ahead of it if it decides to take this political option hmm. look i think there's an opportunity but i think part of the problem is that almost everyone in the movement is thinking in very linear ways and they have the idea that and i mean like i've spoken to i think representatives from every from almost every different movement at one point or another um and the thing is that everyone in the movement has their own sort of plan of this is how this is how we get Cape independence. And all of those plans are different and no one has any interest in really compromising. And so, I mean, Phil Craig's got, um, he's got the best, I would say just objectively, he's the most skilled at this. He's the most pragmatic. He's the most dynamic. He's the best at maintaining and developing contacts with influential members. Um, he's very good at public communication. Um, all of these things, none of these things can be said for any of the other people in the movement to the extent that it's true of Phil Craig. However, um, I, I, I do suspect that um, he is slightly too optimistic about the, the um, um, sorry, that's my dog moaning there. Um, I, I do suspect that he's slightly too optimistic about the, um, uh, about the DA's willingness to collaborate. That's all I would say, really. I think I think the DA are very reluctant, and they don't really want to. They don't really want to do this because they're looking at that big shiny union buildings in Pretoria and hoping to get a seat up there. So, yeah, uh, yeah. I want to throw it up to 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 the people still watching this or watching this. Uh, you can deliver a question that I'll ask. The last question, the last words, give it to us and I'll ask it. But in the meantime, just quickly, um, why do you see the future for the Democratic Alliance? Okay, so King, you've said that. Do you believe that the, the, the Democratic Alliance words will achieve 50% in the next election? Do you think or do you think they will be pushed into a coalition government? I think in the Western Cape, um, if we just look at the trends, I think it's almost inevitable that they will go below 50%. How much they go below 50%, I think is still um, up for debate. But I think if we look at the, the last election results for pro-independence parties, uh, parties that explicitly supported Cape independence went from about 0.1% of the vote to about 5% of the vote overall. So I think um, if we're able to keep the momentum going into 2024, I think... Uh, in conjunction with a number of other anti-independence parties as well, that will be eating into the DA vote base. I think we will be seeing the DA go below 50%. And I think mm. it's also going to be a bleak picture, a picture in the rest of the country for them. I think, although I think Action SA probably is going to do very well in Hauteng, uh, eating into their vote base there. Uh, I don't think they're going to do very well in the rest of the country. Uh, I think uh, they're probably gonna, going to underperform quite significantly. If we look at the local election results, for example, in, around, in Durban, they only got about 2% of the vote. Uh, but I think we're going to see the DA uh, lose the official opposition role in a, a large number of provinces um, in 2024. Uh, I think the EFF is going to continue to be the, the second largest party in most of the north of the country, northwest, uh, Limpopo, Mpumalanga. Um, and, and I think Action SA is probably going to, I don't know if they're going to become the second largest party in Hauteng, but they're certainly going to be the third largest there. And I think we're going to see the IFP continue to make gains uh, in KZN. Uh, so that, that's my expectations for the DA. It's not optimistic in the Western Cape and it's not optimistic in the rest of the country. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, th I think I think what Robert King has said is, is largely true. But I think, you know, m my perspective is always the long term one. Um, and what I would say to anyone in the DA or anyone supporting the DA at this point, instead of supporting something like Cape Independence or what have you, um, it's what is the future of South Africa? And um, I think the, the concrete answer to that is that the, we've already seen a little taste of it in Nelson Mandela Bay. Nelson Mandela Bay, um, a couple of uh, local elections ago, the ANC managed to get 46% against the ANC's 
And they formed a coalition with a couple of little parties. And they got they got in charge. And this lasted for a little while. And in the meantime, the ANC and the EFF and the unions and the civil servants drained the public coffers, sabotaged all of the public infrastructure, and made sure that during the DA's tenure, it was not possible to um, it was not at all possible to govern properly. They made the they made the city ungovernable, destroyed it after already having looted it for years. And when the election came around again, the DA couldn't maintain their. Uh, I mean, the DA could not maintain their their their, uh, their lead over the ANC anymore. They sank down to parity, thirty nine to thirty nine, and the ANC got back in charge by bribing the Patriotic Alliance into into the into participating. So what you really see over there is what it's going to look like at a national level, except that at a national level there are way higher stakes. And as we can see, political assassinations have started bleeding out of the uh, charterist movement and into um, opposition parties. They tried to assassinate a DA councillor in KZN recently. Um, and so what politics is going to look like is going to be increasingly desperate, increasingly violent, increasingly messy, increasingly corrupt, and, in, and, and extremely unstable. Because coalitions, they only take two forms, highly unstable or stable and corrupt. And what it's going to mean is that the long-term version of South Africa is going to be an extremely horrible, horrible place to live that only has a downward spiral ahead of it. Unless there's well, a major revolution that delivers a completely different di political dispensation. I would like to That's just develop on that because I, yeah, I think yeah, uh, Schwane is, uh, is probably going to end up being the next Nelson Mandela Day. Uh, I, was, I, I, I sp uh, mentioned this to Donald just before the, we went live. Um, the, the coalition there seems to be in complete chaos at the moment um, because they're in government, but they're not in power in that city. I mean, yeah. you know, the count, some of the councillors I'm speaking to literally have to have police protection because of the, the threats of violence they receive from members of, uh, in particular, I think the EFF. Uh, and we see this, you know, even Freedom Front Plus councillors now, are, are, you know, in, in uh, across the north of the country uh, are facing threats to their lives. And that's the, the seriousness of the situation we're getting. Uh, and when it goes national, yeah, it's going to be, you know, it's going to go nuclear pretty much. Yeah. And I mean, the DA just do not have what it takes to govern with that kind of power politics. The only, uh, and it's just, it's just not possible. And the thing is that in the meantime, even if you think that, you know, you could build a coalition to do something positive, what have the, what have the DA been doing for the past couple of months? They've been aggressively trashing every single anti-charterist party there is. Like, we are the only party. Everyone must vote for us. All of you are ungrateful little swine. How dare you speak up against us? And it's just, it's the stupidest public communication strategy that any party has ever engaged in. Not because it's the, uh, not because it's the most inept or crazy, but because of the stakes involved. The stakes are absolutely existential for the country. And they're sitting here going, yes, but you know, you have to stick finally to our plan and never consider criticizing us. There's no tolerance that the DHA has for any criticism Except unlike the ANC and the EFF, they don't have the balls to make people shut up. So what they do is they just whine and piss everyone off. And this is destroying their chances, their potential for building a working anti-charterist coalition for 2024 because they have that uh, that big shiny option of going uh, becoming the ANC's little appendix. Who are they in the and, DA? Is, is it Ellen Zilla? Is it John Stena? Is, is, is it everyone? Look, Zilla's been very aggressive in attacking the, the smaller parties. The others have been much more martyr, um, uh, much more uh, measured and mild. But they've all taken the same position that voting for a small party is bad. And if you're voting for a small party, you're hurting the country. And, you know, that kind of maternal figure wagging doesn't go down with anybody. And frankly, and the freedom, you know, the freedom, I, I, I just, I, yeah. The Freedom Front Plus, sorry. Oh yeah, they, they take a almost a completely different stance. I mean, they they openly talk about how we need to have a variety of parties in the run up to the local in the next elections that can uh, you know take over South Africa. Of course, Even they if say that they're, they're, they're one of those minor parties. They want they of want people to vote for them. Oh, well, I think I think they also recognise though that they're not the, uh, a party that can really appeal to every 
demographic in South Africa. I think the DA views themselves as a party that wants to appeal to every demographic. I think the, um, the FF Plus knows who their voters are going to be, and they know that they're not going to be that they're going to be a component of this. They can't be they, they can't be the only component of this. I think the DA might have a different strategy to that. Yeah. I mean, you know, what, what, what can you say? I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's a no-brainer. You do Cape Independence or you watch the entire country, all nine provinces go down the toilet, never to be resuscitated. And um, I think that, you know, the reluctance to engage with Cape Independence is, it's absurdly suicidal for anyone who's part of a racial minority. Um, and, you know, even if you're a black member of the Cape, you're not winning anything by sticking to South Africa. This is a political institution that was created to subjugate you. Do you really think that it's something to hold on to? It's, it's absurd. I don't know how anyone can back the idea of South Africa continuing. It's, it's, it's the most absurd political contrivance on the planet. Hmm. Okay. It seems like the audience isn't delivering a question to, to busy battling each other. So I'm going to give the question. Patrick, uh, what's uh, Kate, uh, Gates and McKenzie, the Patriotic Alliance? What do you guys mm. think of their of his future? Because I've I recently saw an interview with Rob Hershoff, and he says this guy is doing amazing work. And um, <laughs> <laughs> Rob Hershoff, Rob Hershoff has never had one positive or bright political instinct his entire life. He consistently blacks the wrong answer every single. He's in paper. I wouldn't take money from him if he offered it one with a rap bow because i wouldn't know what would happen if he did it i mean he's i mean, think about who he thought the hero of the country was and just a couple of months ago he thought it were musi my mane i mean if that's not a joke to you i mean come on so um look gate mckenzie is extremely shrewd but he's a shrewd gangster his entire party is staffed by former gangsters he um he when he walks into a negotiation the only thing that he asks from his coalition partners is what are you going to give me i want these departments the ones that have the juiciest tenders what has he been doing now that he's in charge of what what municipality is do you remember uh robert what, uh, what central, what? Karoo. central, central Karoo. Karoo district well i have no idea what's going on there but it seems fishy as hell that the first thing that he's done is earmarked a shed load of municipal money for uh, capital initiatives for small companies. Now, they look very sexy. And frankly, um, I, I'm, I'm the kind of person who loves the idea of cutting with the rules and doing something as creative as that. But knowing how Gate McKenzie has squandered millions in his life, uh, that he's received from various, um, and I mean, he claims to be a reformed gangster, but most of his uh, most of his dodgy shenanigans have happened since he's reformed. So, um, I, I mean, look, he's an extremely intelligent guy. He's clearly a very tough individual. Um, he, but anyone who's dealt with him sees him as a two-faced, unreliable, lying, slippery fish, and I don't think that he has any longevity as a political leader. I think that whatever he's doing at the moment, I can't see it lasting. Um, and I'm not, I, I have no idea if anyone's going to benefit. I really hope that even if he's squandering the money from Central Karoo, that those little startups that he's kicked for, you know, brick production and, you know, w whatever he's doing um, will outlive what he's done to the budget. But, you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, and I wouldn't want to go into business with him. He doesn't seem very trustworthy. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical of, of him as well. I mean, I, I'm wondering, because every day on Twitter, you'll see a new post from Gator McKenzie about what he's doing in the Central Crew District. But I just don't know if it's him being very social media savvy with this. I mean, because it's, it's some very basic functions like opening up a pool or turning a pool pump on, and he'll be recording that and showing how successful he is. And I think if we look at the results from the general Karoo municipalities... That in South now, Africa, that can be very successful. Yeah, I mean, look, a water pump is a major success for a government. So, uh, oh, sorry, just a water tap is a success. Um, but if we look at the, the yeah, I'll stand. If we look at the so low. Results, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's and that's so when the DA celebrates their amazing accomplishments, they're comparing it to that. 
which isn't anything really. It's nothing compared with the rest of the world. Um, but if we look at the by-election results coming in from the Kuru now, not the central Kuru, but just the Kuru in general, um, Matsukama municipality, which is on the on the border there next to the coast, uh, there was a by-election in a PA-held ward where the incumbent defected to the DA because because he didn't want to join an ANC coalition. And the D PA vote share went from 27% of the vote there to about 6% of the vote. So uh, I don't know if that's necessarily what's happening, going to happen in the rest of the Karoo, uh, but it's certainly there. It seems like the, uh, the the shine of the PA is certainly gone. Mm. Well, thank yeah, it, you. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I just wanted to say one thing to be remembered about the PA is that they were the coalition partners of the DA in Nelson Mandela Bay that collapsed the uh, coalition over there. So, um, you know, I, I think anyone who's in bed with them better watch out because the highest bidder will take them for a ride. Um, so, Well, they've done that and to I'm, a number of coalitions with the DA in the Western Cape. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, originally they worked with the ANC, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and their first... They work with both. Yeah, and they work with anyone. But, gentlemen, thank you so much. This has been quite an experiment. My focus was a bit everywhere because I had to read the comments and everything. But thank you so much for this. This has been very interesting. Um, to our viewers, I mean, if you like this, we're definitely going to do this more often. So stay tuned, like this video, share it. And, yeah, thank you very much. I assume I just click in broadcast. Thank you,